educated. Our built environments aren't saying so. Hello and good morning. I was not very young when I took my first air travel. And it was an amazing experience. And I'm sure all of you can um, relate to what I'm saying. It was night. The seat was comfortable. And as I looked down, the scene was amazing. It was almost mesmerizing. Down below was spread a beautiful carpet. It was an intriguing weave. And it was embellished with sparkling diamonds. A sense of pride overwhelmed. As I looked at the carpet, it was unbelievable that it was my habitat. That was my city. And somewhere there was my home. The sense of pride indeed overwhelmed. It's actually when urbanity takes on a robe of darkness that everything appears ever so beautiful. But it is when the sun starts shining bright and we are walking the streets in our city that this multi-layered complex weave of the carpet that I'm talking about suddenly springs to life. It is like a giant organism. It is life. And we are its living cells. We are the ones that give it its shape. We are the ones that give it its character. We are the ones who give it its soul. It is our habitat. It's our home. And as a student of architecture, when I was up there in the sky, that was the first time I was seeing how beautiful it can be from far, far away and when it was cloaked in darkness. We talk of Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam. It is an ancient Indian concept. The world is a family. The truth is tangible when we experience this truth here on the earth. The Almighty granted, has granted its creation an instinctive sen sense of self-preservation and procreation. And it is beautiful to see how organisms go about responding to this primordial drive here in this anthills, we are able to see the beauty, the order, and the ingenuity. And here in the beehives, and still further, in the nests that the birds make. So it is very natural to think that when we, who are the most evolved of the race, make a habitat for ourselves, we would put our best efforts into it. Long years ago, that is what the human race did. They built a habitation for themselves that they did with a collective intelligence. They all came together. They understood that they were a community. We are all communal org organisms. And we came together long years ago to understand that we needed a habitat. And how would that habitat be? It would be one which would sustain ourselves, in which we would survive, habitats in which we will enrich ourselves and we would evolve. Many challenges of the built have gone into making these old traditional habitats. Let us understand what the challenges are. When you're making a built environment, you're actually creating a physical environment. We have challenges of technology, of materials, we have to be climate responsive. We have to respond to the topography of the land because you're going to build on the land. These are all the tangibles. These are all the material incomings or inputs. Then we have slightly difficult inputs, like we have social codes, we have cultural nuances, we have aesthetical preferences, and we have behavioral nuances as well. So all of these were blended into these traditional habitats, we can easily say they were smart cities of their era because there was so much of thought that went into it. 
And it is because of these that most of these cities um, have evolved over a period of time and people are still living in them. I'm talking particularly of this place called Brahmapuri. This is the most photographed place because of the beauty of its weave. Um, do you know where this is? This is in Rajasthan. This is at the foothills of the Jodhpur fort. The climate there is extremely harsh. And this is one climate sensitive um, habitat which continues to be used for 500 years of its existence. People still live there. One of the most important things in our habitats is a socio-cultural sustenance. Because these were the crucibles where the culture of the land came to fruition, it was sustained. And today we are a result of what has come forward in all of these old settlements. Let's come back to our times and look at what we are up to. We are building and this is a personal space. Why do I say it's a personal space? This is an individual building. We love to make buildings. We are also making habitats. We are also the collective organisms as of the ages passed by. We have really not changed much on that end. But we like to build among, in, inside walls. So this is a walled piece of built. Is this architecture? No, I think it's an architecture total anarchy. But this is a personal space. This is where I know what I want and I deeply care for it. So I insist on what I want. And whatever I want derives deep inspiration from my trips abroad, from the glossy magazines, from my friend's house, or maybe my friend's mustache. You never know from where the inspiration can come, but it's my personal space. It is within my compound wall, so I'm free to do what I want. And I'm going ahead and doing what I want. Each man in his humor. That was easily a mustache. Inspiration. What inspiration is this? I get my columns from the chewing gum. Well, so this is each man in his humor. And then these walls that we are talking about. We not only wall our houses, but we wall our public buildings also. So our court of law is walled. Our temples are walled. Our public hospitals are walled. And now even a mall is walled. So here is a mall with a wall. Now just notice the wall. It's a beautifully done up wall. It's all cladded in stone. They even have cut a very nice jali on it. They've put this really nice tidy little lamps over there. And so much of thought is getting, getting into the wall that much thought did not go into the mall. And look at how it is sitting right there inside that beautifully done up wall. So we are a culture that loves walls. This is also a wall. And this is in our habitat, our housing settlement. You know the blue settlements, you remember? This is the settlement. It's not blue anymore. Uh, but this is a fairly good settlement. This has a wall too. Now just look at what's happening right outside the wall. Outside the wall, it's not my place. It's not your place. It's nobody's place. It's actually a no man's realm. And this realm is large indeed. It starts out right outside our gate and extends endlessly into our neighborhood open spaces, into our public parks, into transportation hubs, into bazaars, onto street squares, and into our roads, just everywhere. It's a no man's realm. So you see what is happening today? We are having brilliant walled architecture. I just showed you some brilliant walled architecture. But we are having illegible urbanism at the end of the story. This is another example of neither yours nor mine. And another one, neither yours nor mine. But are we realizing that all of this is affecting us? It is as much mine and yours as much it is of anybody else who's supposed to be in charge of it. Who that's supposed to be is nobody knows. We almost think we're conditioned to think that that's the way environments are because you're born into these environments. And we know that's, we probably know that's how it is. You know, it's going to be like that. It, we feel it's a pre-developed package deal given to us. It is affecting us. 
we are talking these days in research, and it is, it's proved beyond point in, in such cases that our built environment affects our behavior, and our behavior goes back into the built environment. And this is what's going to happen. So how can we have such collective apathy? There was collective intelligence at the end of Brahmapuri, that blue settlement that we were talking about. Today we can talk of collective apathy towards environments. You know where this attitude comes? This is our national behavioral trait. Chalta hai. Will do. Why is this coming about? Because in the environment which we just saw, we have to move in every day and out. We have to live our lives there. We have to raise our family, earn our living, grow old, and finally say bye-bye. But it's a trajectory that we move in those environments, and it's very difficult. It compromises on every step. Add to it a lack of sense of belonging. So now what's going to happen? Chalta hai, ye bhi chalta hai, wo bhi. Let life go ahead. So we are a big chalta hai. And this is the behavioral response. Now see. It's chalta hai everywhere. On the traffic light, the father has three impressionable kids on his scooter and he will break the red light. What lesson is he passing on? Chalta hai. You are vandalizing street furniture. We are vandalizing street furniture. No problem. It is there for us. We are spitting on the roads, especially landings of public buildings. So we have to put pictures of gods and goddesses and still people spit. And then we have this Swachh Bharat Abhiyan. Why did we have to start it? Because of our chalta hai. It's cyclical. It's just cyclical. And sometimes we are very good. We are very unintentional. We never look back. Have I vandalized something? No, he's not concerned. See how prettily, merrily he's going about. Am I portraying ourselves as a very bad society, a black society? No, 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 no. Let's have a closer look at these chalta hai people. Me, you, everybody here. We are really good people. Let's get into understanding why we are good people. We are a culture conscious society, aren't we? We are proud of our legacy. We are proud of our arts and crafts and our um, performing arts. We love our handloom weaves. We have celebrations around the year where these handloom weaves and other kinds of costumes which are traditional are shown off to the helm of things. And so we have these big fat weddings also. So we are actually quite culturally aware and quite culturally, um, we also love our culture. We are also um, ingrained into traditions which have come down over centuries. We respect our old. We touch their feet. We take care of them. What else do we do? Plenty of things. So we are respecting our old as one of the things. We understand the very profound concept of oneness of life. And so, many of us here are vegetarians. We are one of the only nations on the globe where vegetarianism is still a way of life. So we're vegetarians, we care for oneness of life, we practice yoga compulsively. We don't even have space to practice yoga, and so in the morning you will find people are doing it right on the pavements and everywhere, and see how this Firang is so amused. Yoga karrelo. Yeah? This brings us to the case of smart cities. Everybody is talking smart. Architects and planners are also talking smart. So we have these smart city conceptions and a lot of pictures are getting floated on the web. So we have all of these pictures that are amusing us. And in the middle, there has to be a transportation. What are they really talking about? Are we aware that the government manifesto is actually saying that these are going to be cities that shall invite or um, you know, they will be attracting a lot of investments. That's the government agenda. And they are extremely um, facility oriented. So they're going to give you electricity and sanitation and water supply and good education and Medicare and all of that kind of thing. And of course, transportation. We're just talking of transportation. The problem with this is they are going to give it to us. Do we know what they're really giving to us? What's going to happen at the end of it? The entire exercise is non-transparent. We, are, we have to work collectively towards our habitats. They keep saying it's a, um, it's a participatory process. But I think most of us here do not know what the ultimate of it is going to come to. It, is, uh, it looks very myopic if it is looked into deeply. Not only that, there are a lot of missing things in the smart city conceptions. So they're wanting 
just today morning, the headlines were that you must take urbanity as a good opportunity. That's what Prime Minister Modi is saying. So we are all thinking that, yes, it's going to give us a lot of facilities because that's what is missing at our end. But is facilities, are facilities going to do, give us a smart city is a question at hand. And we have to get concerned because it's our environment. So he says, who wants to change? So all Indians are saying, we want to change. And so they're giving you this 100 smart cities. And how many of us want to change? No. We don't want to do it. So we are really complacent about what a smart city is. I want to just um, quickly go through what we need in a smart city. So those are the pictures that are being uh, floated on the web and everywhere else about how cities will be tall and technologically driven and all of that. But actually what we need is this. We need a small one where you can hear more voices coming in. And uh, this is another thing that we need. We need a city where we can connect, where we can interact, um, where we can a city that is going to foster the human spirit. And of course we need technology. Technology is supposed to be a silent facilitator who shall let us go through our life cycles and our lifestyle and our culture and our daily business in a very efficient manner. But it needs to be a silent facilitator. It doesn't have to be a celebration itself. We seem to be obsessed in making a technology as a celebration. It is to foster human life. That is what the urban celebration has to be. See what we need in a smart city. We need human centricity. The, the kids are all out on the roads expressing creativity. They, have, they probably don't have a space at home. What else do we need in a small city? See what happens when you have facilities? This is a facility and this is the way it comes. So when you are here under the tree in the shade, you need a facility. So the facility is given to you. See this? Eat your chola badura, sitting there in the sun on those benches. Common sense also, or smartness. Let's come to built environments. That is one subject we never touch. Why? Built environments is a huge gray area. Multiple concerns, plenty of them complex. Where do we start? At the school level. The school can become a 3D model where you can start understanding how the systems in a building work. You know, the sewerage works, the water supply works, the rain water harvesting works, the solar works, yeah, coming together, the community of a school works together. So all of this, the school can be a 3D model for, and these can be extrapolated onto a larger level of urbanity so that by the time a child leaves, he becomes more and more aware of the issues that he is going to confront when he works in the world. Sustainability. We are always talking of sustainability. First in the 80s, it was sustainability. It became green, and now it has become smart. But the way we're defining it is extremely constricted. We are talking of conserving natural resources, or we are talking of conserving energy. What about socio-cultural sustenance? Is that not important? Smart cities may undo this. We had this question about human spirit. Yeah. So that's the question at hand. And lastly, I would like to say that the entire education needs to move towards creativity. To be able, because today what we are lacking most is vision and imagination. So what we need, let's go reverse. We need a knowledge and understanding of issues so that we can feed them onto imagination. And our imagination can then give us a vision. And let me tell you, school children are full of imagination. I think it's this 10, 12 years, and then the tuition classes are the end that really do the end of it. By the time we are in first year, oof. And then the field affecting human communities, the built environment needs to be addressed. So I'm going to now quickly read this, and you're going to be relieved I'm coming to the end. If together we desire to care for our built environments, if together we desire to enrich them, only then shall they be a mirror of our deep cultural ethos. Only then there will be a cultural continuum. Only then shall we be smart people, and our build shall reflect our glory. This is the need of the hour, a dire need indeed. Thank you, audience.